and there, but for the vast majority it stays clear. Now for the Northern Isles, we'll see that lingering cloud lowering to give some fog and some drizzle in places. In towns and cities, temperatures holding up, but in rural parts they're dipping close to, if not just below freezing. So a fresh start to the weekend, but a beautiful start once again. Bright blue skies for the vast majority, barely a cloud in the sky for many uh, away from the far north of Scotland, that is. And it will stay dry throughout Saturday, throughout Sunday as well. I think on Saturday night and into Sunday, there'll be a bit more cloud coming along. But on Saturday afternoon, those temperatures rising up to the mid to high teens, once again, fairly widely under that sunshine. Now out in the North Sea, you can see some low cloud that's going to start to creep closer to the east coast of the UK on Saturday night, perhaps giving a misty, foggy start for some on Sunday and bringing some cloud in for eastern parts of the country during the daytime, but it will stay dry. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11pm, seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome to The Briefing with me, Isabel Oakeshop. It's two years since COVID restrictions came into effect. I'll reflect on the ongoing virtue signalling of mask wearers. Plus, should a Ukrainian President Zelensky be given the Nobel Peace Prize? I'm going to be speaking to the man leading a last minute campaign to get him that award. And we'll hear from the boss of Feeding Britain as the cost of living bites. And we'll be telling you all about a great conspiracy concerning eggs. But first, it's the news. Good afternoon. It's one minute past 12. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. US President Joe Biden has announced a joint game plan with the EU to reduce Europe's dependency on Russian energy. The US will provide the EU with at least 15 billion additional cubic metres of liquefied natural gas by the end of the year. During a press conference in Brussels, President Biden said the EU shouldn't be subsidising Putin's brutal attack on Ukraine. I know that eliminating r Russian gas will have costs for Europe, but it's not only the right thing to do from a moral standpoint, it's going to put us on a much stronger strategic footing. Ukraine's deputy prime minister says a humanitarian corridor will be opened out of the besieged city of Mariupol today for those who have access to a car. 
Tens of thousands of civilians are believed to be trapped in the southern port city with little food, water, medicine, power and heat. It's been reported 300 people were killed when Russia bombed a theatre sheltering women and children in Mariupol last week. The UN Refugee Agency says around 3.7 million people have fled Ukraine since the conflict began. The British Ministry of Defence says Ukraine has reoccupied towns and defensive positions up to 21 miles east of the capital, Kiev. It also says that in the south of Ukraine, Russian forces heading to Odessa are being slowed by logistic issues and Ukrainian resistance. The Ukrainian president told the European Union it acted too late to stop the Russian invasion. He accused the EU of failing to impose sanctions and block the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline early enough. Volodymyr Zelensky said he was grateful to the EU for the steps they've taken, but urged the Union to act swiftly in accepting Ukraine's membership. The country must work towards peace, move forward. With each day of our defence, we are bringing the peace we need so much closer. We are bringing victory closer. Vladimir Zelensky there. North Korea's state news agency says Kim Jong-un ordered the launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile because of the long-standing confrontation with the US. New footage shows the country's leader personally overseeing the missile takeoff. This is the first full test of this kind of long-range missile by North Korea since 2017. China has urged all sides to exercise restraint regarding the test. The Transport Secretary says the p and ferries boss should resign after sacking 800 workers without notice, replacing them with cheaper agency staff. CEO Peter Hebblethwaite admitted the new crews are being paid below the UK's minimum wage on international routes, but he insists it is legal. Grant Shapps told GB News his actions were unacceptable, adding that he'll change the law so the company must pay minimum wage. The brazen, breathtaking arrogant as he sat there and told us, told Parliament, we decided it would be better to break the law. Uh, we are going to make it absolutely clear that is unacceptable. They are going to need to do a U-turn because we're going to come for, I'm going to come forward next week with a package of measures to Parliament, uh, which will require ships that sail from here to be uh, on the regular route, applying the regular route to be paying the minimum wage. Grant Shapps there. A new test to detect potentially life-threatening preeclampsia in pregnant women will be available on the NHS. Preeclampsia affects some women, usually during the second half of pregnancy or, or soon after labour, and can lead to serious complications if it isn't picked up early. Tests have been available to help rule out the condition, but midwives will now be able to test to detect a positive diagnosis. In Wales, COVID restrictions are set to be relaxed further from Monday. The legal requirement to wear face coverings in shops and on public transport will end, as will uh, the need to self-isolate. Masks will still be required in health and care settings and businesses must continue to carry out COVID-19 risk assessments. And the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are visiting the Bahamas as they begin the final leg of their Caribbean tour. The Bahamian Prime Minister acknowledged the Queen's Jubilee, saying we'll never see a reign like hers again. They faced strong criticism from campaigners on the tour, seeking reparations from the monarchy for its role in the slave trade. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Isabel Oakshot with the briefing. Coming up this hour on The Briefing, we're about to hear from a Ukrainian businessman who swapped his briefcase for an assault rifle. Make sure you don't miss that one. And how do you feel about Rishi Sunak's spring statement? Will it make your life easier? We'll hear for a charity on what they think he should have said. And bird flu means no free-range eggs have been sold in the UK since November. And yet, eggs are still being labelled as free-range. Now, there's a crackdown. We'll ask Britain's egg boss what's going on. And we always want to hear your views. Send in your opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews.
So we are now a month into the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the latest news from the region this morning is harrowing. A senior Ukrainian official has accused Moscow of forcibly deporting more than 400,000 civilians from war-torn Ukrainian cities to Russia as a tactic to pressurize Vladimir Volensky, the president, into surrendering. Now, President Zelensky is showing absolutely no sign of doing that. He continues to stand strong. He is insisting his country will never surrender. So, does he deserve the Nobel Peace Prize? Seems to me that that is a bit of a no-brainer. But one problem is that this year's nominations have already closed. Unfortunately, they closed right before the invasion. However, one campaigner in the Netherlands is not letting that stand in his way. He spent the last 10 days ringing round the great and the good, gathering their support for a late entry for the Nobel Peace Prize for Zelensky. So I'm delighted now to speak to Oliver van Loo in the Netherlands about this incredible campaign. Thank you for coming on GB News, uh, Oliver. Tell us, where did this campaign start? What made you decide to take it up? Thank you, Isabel, for having me. So it's uh, great to, to, to join your, your show. Um, let's say, I think uh, after seven days um, after the invasion, that is seven days after February 24th, uh, the discussion in Europe was, can Ukraine join uh, the EU? Can they join NATO? To, can we provide an offline zone? And the answer to a lot of those questions was uh, no. So my idea was, what can we do? What is within our possibilities? And this is actually the outcome of that question. We can nominate the courageous people of Ukraine and their president for the Nobel Peace Prize. Is it, is it President Zelensky just him that you want nominated or is it also for the whole nation of Ukraine? Well, absolutely. Um, uh, I think the, the people of Ukraine, they show so much courage. They show that how, how much they value their freedom. And it's actually not only their freedom, it's also the freedom of Europe or to say the, the freedom of the, of the entire world. Um, and therefore, I, and I don't want to think for the Nobel Committee. Um, I think it's already, it would be a break with their procedure if, if they would reopen the nomination procedure. So that's why we suggested to nominate the brave people of Ukraine and their president. And who have you managed to get on board with your campaign so far? I know you've been working incredibly hard. Your, your day job, you're a lobbyist, so you've got brilliant contacts. Uh, tell us some of the names that have signed up to this campaign. Well, so far we have uh, two um, former MEPs from the United Kingdom. That's uh, Jackie Jones from the uh, Labour Party, I think, and um, Dinesh Domali from the Liberal Democrats. And um, aside, uh, outside of the UK, we have a uh, former Prime Minister of Belgium, uh, Guy Verhofstadt, uh, the former Prime Minister of Lithuania, uh, Andreas Kobilius, the former Prime Minister of Estonia, um, and, but also the former uh, Euro Commissioner, Nelly Cruz. Um, and yesterday morning, I got a, a, a wake-up call by uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the former Prime Minister of Luxembourg and the President of the European Commission. Fantastic get for you to get uh, uh, Juncker on board and a number of very other prominent po politicians. But in the UK, um, you mentioned a couple of former MEPs, MEPs that uh, perhaps aren't household names here. Um, surely you should be getting uh, former prime ministers, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, uh, Theresa May, David Cameron. Would you like to get them on board? Well, absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, they, they should definitely join this, uh, this, this list and this call, this letter. Uh, I would be delighted to hear from them if they would uh, support this letter, put their name on it. But also, I have to say, someone else who is also a hero in Ukraine is David Beckham. He's not a former prime minister, but what he did with donating or giving his Instagram, Instagram account to a doctor in Kharkiv, that's, that's brilliant. So if he's uh, listening or watching, uh, Mr. Beckham is very much welcome to sign a letter as well. Uh, brilliant. Well, well, let's see if we can get that message through to David Beckham. Um, now, I understand that you had some contact with uh, former US Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, uh, who sadly passed away this week, but you had also reached out to her for your campaign. Can you tell us about that? 
Yes, that, that's right. Um, so I had a phone call with her last week, and um, which was uh, such an honor to to speak with such a powerful, um, important uh, person in history. And um, she expressed her, her support for the initiative. She called it brilliant. And um, we just needed to, to formalize it. Um, and due to practical uh, details, I, I needed her email address and uh, I, I sent a letter by text and I was waiting for her response. Uh, so she's not on the list because, um, well, she expressed her support, but I just asked her, uh, please read the letter carefully and then respond to me if you definitely, if you, if you want to join the, the, the letter. But it was, um, of course, a great experience to, to speak with someone that important. And um, it was great to hear from her that she very much supported the initiative. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us to talk about that campaign. And we really look forward to hearing how it's getting on. I hope we can encourage some uh, serious senior figures here to sign up to that too. I'm sure they'd be delighted to. Thank you, uh, Oliver Van Loo. Thank you so much, Isabel. Now, I'm pleased to say I hope we can now speak to Alexander Nosashenko, who is usually the managing director of the real estate company Colliers, big international property company. Uh, he's based in Ukraine, uh, but now he's joined the fight at the front lines near Kiev. Um, I'm sorry we've had some difficulty uh, reaching you, but I think our viewers will be able to see why. Uh, can you hear me there, Alexander? I, yes, absolutely, I do. Oh, we, oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, well, wow. Can you, can you talk us through where you are now uh, in so far as you can uh, and what you're doing? How have you found yourself uh, in this position? Well, the whole thing started uh, some 30 days ago. So at that time, I was uh, on the streets uh, of Kiev from day one of invasion. Uh, I spent uh, the first three days being on the streets, uh, sleeping outdoors, because at that time nobody could understand what's going to happen, and we should uh, have been reacting in a certain manner. Uh, I'm just 100% Ukrainian, uh, pure civilian, have never been to military service, uh, have never uh, taken part in any military campaign. But I've been uh, from 2014, when uh, uh, the whole thing started in Ukraine with Russia, I started to heavily train uh, with uh, uh, one of the best snipers in Ukraine. And for those six years, I've uh, been practicing um, different types of shooting for more or less three times a week. So this is my, he is now my commander. His name is Alexander B. If, if you want, I can show him to you. Yes, please. We would love to see, we would love to see that if you're able to, to show yeah. him. Um, so just for yeah. my understanding and for the understanding of our... Hello there. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. understand that you're Alexander's commander now. Um, can I just try to understand here? You said that you've been practicing three times a week since 2013. Um, is that something that you're doing, you have been doing privately or is it through some kind of scheme or is this just something you two have worked on together? Can you explain? No, this person who is now my commander, he is uh, one of the best snipers of Ukraine. Uh, he is uh, two times world champion, uh, uh, world champion among the military and police uh, forces, which uh, takes place in Hungary. Uh, so he's been uh, uh, in special forces uh, called Alpha. It's anti-terrorist organization for uh, for 16 years. So basically, all his life he was uh, as a military person. Everything right. that I know, I know from him, uh, because he's been uh, retired some years ago. But uh, from 2014, he started to teach uh, different people. He uh, set up the Ukrainian Federation for. Yeah long-range shooting 
Also, the sports shooting club Alpha Bravo, which is uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, clubs across Ukraine. So basically, I started to train with him. Yes, it was a completely private. Uh, I mean, I was finding it from my brown pockets, all the ammo, all the firearms, everything, all the equipment. And um, and you did that because uh, you you sensed you know obviously the war had already started there was already a conflict going on and you 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 knew in your heart that this was going to build up and it was at one point going to become existential for your country is that right you saw this coming? Look for me it was uh, absolute 2014 for me was uh, uh, extremely difficult why because. At that time, I realized no matter how fast I can swim five uh, kilometers in open water or how many push-ups I can do, I was not able to protect uh, my loved ones at that time because I didn't have any knowledge of how, use, uh, how to use firearms. So for me, it was very difficult uh, because I realized that whatever I do and whatever I know, uh, it's not helping me to protect my family and the loved ones. After that, uh, moment when things more or less went back to normality in 2015. I decided that uh, besides being just a sports athlete, uh, amateur, I will be uh, spending all of my free time for um, to master any types of shooting. And this is what I did. Uh, it's like I was getting myself prepared uh, for a day like this. It may sound weird, but uh, you know, it's always better to be prepared. Well, That's I realized in 2014. Yes. I never knew I would use that knowledge, but unfortunately this day came. Right, and just uh, so that people can get a, a sense of your normal life before this happened, um, you would normally be, you're a property guy, right? Your, your normal life is in a nice office, you know, dealing with spreadsheets and uh, you know, balances and commercial deals, is that right? It's nothing to do with being outside uh, any physical type of role. Well, for me, it was pretty simple. Uh, I could escape any time to Europe and enjoy life in Europe. I have enough of uh, savings. I have uh, my speciality and my profession allows me to work in any uh, part of the world, given that I'm an English speaking person and I'm working for a multinational company. Uh, but uh, I made a decision uh, to stay in Ukraine, uh, to evacuate my family a long time before everything happened. Basically, uh, what I did was uh, I evacuated my family, my wife and my kids, end of December, uh, because this is exactly the time when I had a conversation with one of the knowledgeable sources that the Russian aggression is pretty, uh, has pretty high probability. So I said that they are staying in France and I'm getting back to Kiev. The reason why I did this was pretty simple. There are many people who can escape, but there are also those who cannot. Uh, so what happens to those who cannot escape, who have no means to travel or to uh, immigrate to Europe? Uh, those will be ultimately yeah. ki killed by Russians. That's crystal clear. Yes. Uh, and then a big question mark was, why was I doing this you know, training for all these six years? Probably for the moment like this. So that's the reason why I made a decision yes. to stay. Yes. Um, and tell me, is it true, I have picked up that now it is very, very difficult for people who do not have much money to leave Ukraine because the administration there, the authorities are demanding significant payments from people if they wish to leave the country. Is that, is that true? Uh, can I say it again? Because, uh, the, the yes, I'm sorry, we've got some, some difficulties with the line here. Um, I hope that you can hear me. Can you hear me all right? Well, I we can lost hear. you. Well, I will Thank try you. A few difficulties here. Can this. Um, yeah, I'm going to try again here, just in case you can hear me. Is it true that it's very difficult to leave the country now unless you have a lot of money because certain authorities there are demanding payments from people if they're going to leave? Is that true? 
Right. I think we've uh, lost Alexander there. I think we were in incredibly lucky to get him for as long as we did. We can see he's absolutely out uh, in the field there and presumably that is actually quite dangerous. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, to him uh, for risking joining us. Now, the Chancellor has been facing heavy criticism for his spring statement address to the Commons on Wednesday. He's been accused of not having a plan to deal with the cost of living crisis because prices are going up for everybody across the country. Uh, and one area in particular where I think we're all feeling it is in the supermarkets as food prices are rocketing. And people are warning that if the government don't do something, then they're going to go up still further, as much as 15%, which is pretty alarming. And this is coming partly because of the war with Russia and Ukraine, and that's going to exacerbate the situation with prices because they are, both of those countries are among the world's biggest suppliers of wheat. Uh, Russia, a much bigger supplier than Ukraine, but they are both uh, key exporters. So joining me now to discuss this is the National Director of Feeding Britain, Andrew uh, Forsey. Um, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Andrew. Um, how bad are things now for the people that your organisation helps and how bad is it going to get? Well, when the Chancellor stood up in the House of Commons on Wednesday, Isabel, to deliver his statement, I certainly didn't envy him. Let's face it, he's been dealt a pretty bad hand by recent events. But he did have a choice over how to play that hand. And if you ask the hard up pensioners, disabled people, or families with kids who seek our help, they would have told you in no uncertain terms that he could have played that hand a lot better than he actually did. Well, in, in what way? I mean, what do you think he should have done? What would you specifically like to have seen? I mean, can you keep this brief, by the way, because we haven't got much time, but just a few top lines. I think the simplest and most effective thing he could have done was to link much more closely the payments of universal credit and pension credit to the real cost of living for people at the bottom of the pile. Although it seems like an age ago now, this time last year when we had a temporary 20 quid a week increase in universal credit, the numbers of people having to use a food bank was actually coming down quite rapidly and that was after a decade of continuous growth. Sadly that lesson wasn't heeded on Wednesday. My fear, therefore, is that the window of opportunity that we had to continue shortening the queues outside food banks has been slammed firmly shut. About the food banks then, um, are those um, queues and the demands for food bank banks getting noticeably greater? They are, Isabel. And what's been striking over the past six months within our network is both the numbers of people seeking our help for the first time, who themselves are often in low paid work or in self-employment, but also changes in the habits and behaviour of those who had been accessing our help previously, maybe once a month or once every six weeks, who we now see weekly, if not daily, and who rely on us for a lot more food than they used to, and also the help we can offer towards their gas and electricity costs as well to actually cook that food and keep their homes warm as well. So there have been some very striking changes over these past six months already, and that's before this whacking round of price increases that's coming our way in a week or so's time. Can you paint a picture for um, those of uh, us, uh, myself, and viewers that are lucky enough not to uh, be absolutely on the, on the breadline like that, to have to resort to using a food bank? I mean, how does it feel um, at, at the moment for people in that position? Um, talk to us about you know, the experience of going to a supermarket for them and what kind of judgments they're having to make uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Certainly, Isabel, the, the feeling of having to use a food bank is one of hitting rock bottom. And for too many people, it almost feels like an admission of defeat. I can no longer afford to feed myself and my family while keeping a roof above our heads. That's the feeling that people have. Overwhelmingly, within my charity, we seek to set up projects that fill the gap between a supermarket and a food bank. We call them affordable food clubs because it maintains that bit of dignity. It doesn't feel like you're hitting rock bottom. You're saving a lot of money on your food, but it's not quite that sense of stigma and shame that comes with having to seek a food bank voucher. 
And just as a final question, I mean, most people who are not in that position from an outside point of view would say, well, look, you know, no one in Britain should be going hungry. You know, everybody has got access to, to benefits if they're that hard up. How is it that things have reached such a desperate situation for so many people? Well, I think, as we just discussed, the level of those benefits and pensions ain't going to keep pace with the real cost of living in the months ahead. I think, secondly, there are schemes like pension credit or Healthy Start or even free school dinners that don't have as high a level of take up as they should, perhaps because yeah. they're not well known or they're quite difficult to apply right. for. So we need to maximise take up of them and make sure that benefits keep pace with the cost of living. They're two things. Thank you very much uh, to you from your organisation, Feeding Britain. Now, it is the Oakshot Opinion. This now, it's the Oakshot Opinion. This time two years ago, we were a few days into the first national lockdown in history, having been told that it was three weeks to flatten the curve. Remember that? Well, I think it's right to reflect on where we are now and what we've learned. And I'm going to do something a little bit different this morning, uh, or really, it's almost afternoon now, and address my thoughts to one particular person, Dragon's Den star Deborah Meaden. Earlier this week, I questioned why, long after the pandemic is over, so many people are still wearing masks, even outside. After all, we now know these bits of cloth are completely useless unless they're properly fitted medical grade masks. And when did you last see anyone out and about with one of those on? I put out a tweet observing that you can open the prison door, but some people will always prefer captivity. Well, that seemed to upset quite a lot of people, including TV star Deborah, a dragon who certainly can't breathe any fire because her nose and mouth are covered by a mask. This dragon, it seems, is still in semi-hiding. Now, Deborah told me that, quote, without knowing people's worries or vulnerabilities, it's best just not to comment. Well, Deborah, I've got news for you. It's my job to comment. That is literally what I do. I do it for a living. The clue's in the title. I'm a political commentator. And let's be honest, masks are political. Unless you happen to work in a hospital or a laboratory, they're frankly nothing to do with medicine or genuine infection control. They are, in my view, completely unnecessary symbols of fear and repression. And it's time everybody put them right back where they belong, in the bin. Now, look, I do believe in freedom of choice, and it's great that in this country you can walk down the street wearing a burqa, if that's what your religion demands of you, or a pair of hot pants and a bikini top, if the weather's nice enough. If people want to carry on muzzling themselves, then good luck to them. They're free to do that if they want. But I'm not going to pretend I don't frankly find it pretty weird, that I don't think they're a bit daft, or even that I don't think it's a good thing for this country. It is not a good thing for this country if a bunch of people are still going around hiding their faces so the rest of us can't see them properly, don't know if they're smiling, can't hear what they're saying as they mumble behind their muzzles, don't know if they're happy or sad. Now, Peter, people on Twitter say, don't judge. Well, actually, I do judge, because after two years of fear and repression, it's time to move on. Deborah, we know what works now and what doesn't when it comes to controlling the spread of this virus, and we know that wearing masks is no longer, and frankly never was, a tool that we need against a virus that is fortunately no longer such a threat. I think it's time to feel the sun on our faces and open up to each other to stop treating each other as biohazards. That isn't good or kind. It puts up unnecessary barriers between us. These masks are a symbol of what was, not of our brighter future. In my view, they're an ugly relic of a campaign of fear and manipulation, the likes of which I hope we will never see in this country again. So Deborah Meaden, she says she'll keep wearing the mask, I quote, for others. And that, to me, is the ultimate virtue signal. But when you think about it, it's not so nice. You see, Deborah, if you've got or might have coronavirus, the best way you can protect others is keeping away from them entirely. If you think, Deborah, that you might be a super spreader, take a lateral flow test or just stay at home. 
And if you haven't got it, then why hide your face? We'd all really like to see you. Nobody in this country is required by law to wear a mask anymore, and the laws of common sense say everybody should have ditched these completely useless rags long ago. You, Deborah, can help send out the message that it's time to stop being frightened. You can lead by example, help people feel free. And until you do that, and I say this very respectfully, you're not part of the solution or being kind, you are part of the problem. That's the Oakshot opinion. Now, later in the show, North Korea has tested a missile which could allow Kim Jong-un to hit the US with nukes. We'll ask a security expert how serious a threat that is. But first, here's Rhiannon with the news. Thank you, Isabel. It's 12.32, your top stories from the GB Newsroom. President Joe Biden has announced a joint game plan between the US and the EU that will reduce Europe's dependency on Russian energy. As part of the plan, the US will provide the EU with at least 15 billion additional cubic metres of liquefied natural gas by the end of the year. The Transport Secretary has called on the P&O Ferries boss to resign after he sacked 800 workers without notice, replacing them with cheaper agency staff. Grant Shapps told GB News CEO Peter Hebblethwaite's actions were unacceptable, adding that he'll change the law so the company has to pay minimum wage. The Irish Foreign Minister has been removed from stage in Belfast while he was giving a speech after a suspicious device was found in a hijacked van in the venue's car park. It's reported the van's driver was held at gunpoint and ordered to drive to the venue. Simon, Co Simon Coveney said he was saddened and frustrated by the incident. The boss of dairy giant Arla says the price of a pint of milk is likely to go up as farmers struggle with rising costs of feed, fertiliser and fuel. In the last 10 years, consumer prices have gone up 26%, whereas the cost of milk has dropped by 7%. And in Wales, more than 1,400 people have been admitted to hospital with COVID-19, the highest number of admissions for over a year. The First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, says these numbers and an increasing community transmission is a concern for NHS staff. COVID restrictions in Wales were set to be relaxed further from Monday. But Mark Drakeford says some rules must stay for longer. We will retain the legal requirement to wear face coverings in health and social care settings. We continue to advise people strongly to wear a face covering in crowded indoor public places, including in shops and on public transport. It's one of those simple actions. Well, Isabel Oakeshott won't like that. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. It's back to the briefing with Isabel in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. 
And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud. Belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. Now, it's been years since widespread horror at battery farming chickens saw more free-range eggs being put on Britain's supermarket shelves. But did you know that no free-range eggs have actually been sold in this country since November? Highly contagious bird flu has been ripping through the poultry population right across Europe, and millions of birds have been culled as a result of that. And because of that, the UK government has insisted that hens be kept in lockdown since last autumn. And, and this is all hens, by the way. If you happen to have a few hens in your garden, or they were in your garden, but they're now, they have to be caged, right up to the huge uh, factories. That hasn't stopped egg producers still labelling their eggs as free range. Uh, we had a look in uh, a supermarket and uh, lo and behold, we found these eggs just happily on the shelves and they are a case in point because they were bought from a mainstream supermarket last night. And although we're not going to embarrass uh, the particular retailer concerned, they are British eggs and they are indeed labelled as free range. And I'm pretty sure if we extended that investigation to all the supermarkets, we would probably find the same. So the government has cracked down on this, insisting that eggs have to be labelled now as barn eggs until they can be truly free range again. Um, but avian flu is becoming a massive problem. It is now endemic and the fear is... Uh, that it's going to be very difficult for birds to go outdoors again. So let's speak to Andrew Jorrett, the chairman of the British Egg Industry Council, about what exactly is going on here. Um, thank you for joining us. I mean, this is, I think, um, very, very interesting because we've all been so distracted, I think, with, with COVID um, and now with the war, that I think that very few people realise that there is a wholesale uh, lockdown going on of our poultry population. Yes, good afternoon, Isabel. Um, you're right, this has been the worst bird flu season that we've ever experienced. Uh, and at the end of November last year, the government's chief veterinary officer ordered that all poultry be kept indoors, that is poultry that go outside normally. And that will affect free-range flocks, but it's not just about free-range flocks, it, it's all poultry, so it would be ducks, chickens, turkeys, you name it. And, the problem and, we have... Yes, I'm sorry to in interrupt you there, and I, I am right, aren't I, that this affects all uh, poultry. So, for example, someone in my family have got three um, beautiful hens. I believe they have been locked up since uh, last November as well. It, you know, nobody has spared this, are they? No, that's absolutely right. It, it applies to all poultry. And that includes if you've just got a few hens in, in the back, back garden at home. The, the problem, however, with people who keep hens in their back garden is, is, is knowing about the situation, is getting the information through to them that they have to keep those birds shut in. So whilst they should be shut in, if you go around, you'll still see quite a few birds in back gardens that are not shut in. Right, the, the commercial, I see. The, the commercial flocks, of course, have all, because they know about the situation, have all been shut in since the end of November. So let's talk about what's going on in supermarkets then. Um, you know, if you pop down to any of the big name supermarkets today and you want to try and buy free range eggs, will you be able to do so? Not labelled as free range. What you can buy is eggs that come from free range hens, which are now being marked up as barn. And the reason they're now being marked up as barn is under EU marketing legislation, which of course we inherited uh, with, with Brexit, you have a 16 week period 
during which the eggs can of housing during which the eggs can continue to be sold as free range. And the clock has just run out on that. We've just gone over the 16 weeks as of right. this Monday. Right. So from this Monday, what you're starting to see is eggs that are marked as they'll still be in free range packs, but they'll have a number two on the egg, which indicates that they're barn eggs. And there's an explanation in, every, in the lid of every egg pack telling you what the egg codes mean. And on the pack itself, they'll either be carrying a label which says they're barn eggs, or if it's what we call a direct print pack, which most of them nowadays would be, in the direct print, you'll see the, the wording barn egg. Not only right. that, the retailers themselves are under obligation to inform consumers. So there should be some sort of posters or notices in store, as well as uh, on their online um, um, uh, parts. Right. Well, I very much hope that we see that. I mean, I have a special interest in farm animal welfare. I think chickens uh, get a particularly lousy deal, as you know, generally. Um, people think that there's no such thing as uh, caged farming anymore, but many, many chickens are kept in appalling conditions. Even in barns, they tend to be desperately overcrowded. Um, I'm interested to hear from you. If these eggs are now labelled barn eggs, uh, how confident consumers can be about whether those birds are having any kind of decent life? Well, I think what you need to remember is that when you look at free range flocks and free range is the majority production method in this country now, 60% of all the eggs that are produced in this country are now free range. The conditions inside the house where the birds live is, is exactly the same actually as the conditions in a barn house. So there's more than enough space within the house. And not only that, within the house, you have the birds have their feed, their water and their nest boxes. And at night, on a free range flock, all the birds would be inside anyway. They come and go as they please during the day, normally, but at night time they're housed up. What producers have had to do, what farmers have had to do, since the birds were housed, when on that first day that you would expect birds to be able to go outside, you'll see them queuing up at the pop holes. Not every bird goes out straight away, but some, some go out frequently, some actually never go out at all, but it's, it's their choice what they do. And you'll see the birds queuing up. So what the farmers have to do is make sure that they're walking the hens more to, to make sure that they don't um, cause uh, pile-ups and smother. You also need to increase the amount of enrichments, as we call them, in the house. That's things like lucerne bales or um, hanging CDs or plastic yeah. bottles with some water in. Something the birds can peck at without doing any damage, but it just keeps them occupied. Right. And just and very, has, very quickly... Been, that has been going on since the since the end of November with the, all these flocks. When's this going to end? Very quickly. We think quite shortly. Uh, oh, good. I can't say exactly how long, and it will be the government which will decide. But I'm expecting it. It'll happen by mid-April because the risk will have gone down dramatically by then. It comes in. The bird flu comes in with migrating waterfowl that are coming down from Siberia and the Arctic to spend the winter here. They're now about reversing that flow, and they'll be going north to, to their breeding grounds. So we expect the veterinary risk assessment very shortly to say that the risk has gone down a bit and once more the farmers will be able to let their hands out, which is of course just what they want to do. Thank you so much. So hopefully just in time for the summer. Thank you very much to our amazing egg expert there. Now, yesterday, uh, Western leaders gathered in Brussels for a NATO summit, a G7 leaders meeting and a meeting of the European Council. And that was to try to coordinate a unified message uh, and actions on Ukraine. Uh, GB News political editor Darren McCaffrey spoke to Peter Starno, the EU's spokesman for foreign affairs, and started by asking if the idea of Western unity on Ukraine was overblown, particularly on the question of gas and oil. There has been unprecedented unity both within the EU but also with our partners and these days in Brussels are a very good expression of it. We have a NATO summit, we have G7 summit, we have European Union summit and uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky is joining, American President Biden is joining. So this shows the, the strength and the unity uh, among the transatlantic partners on one hand. And on the other hand, of course, when you have within the EU 27 member states, of course you have differing opinions how to advance towards the main objective. The main objective here is to curtail and curb Putin's ability to finance his machinery in Ukraine. And this is what we are doing. The sanctions uh, involved until now, the sanctions adopted until now are showing the effects. And there are differing views whether we should comp 
continue with the sanctions with a very, very fast tempo and intensity of the sanctions or whether we should maybe wait to see the effects and uh, what else could be done instead of sanctions. Sanctions are not the only tool we have, but of course we are using them if we think it's uh, the appropriate time to use them. Nothing is off the table and the discussions continue. And that there are differing views about the speed and extent is just natural with 27 member states. What, what are those other tools then, aside from sanctions? Apart from the sanctions, there is also the strong support to Ukraine, the help to Ukrainian defenders, to the freedom fighters, to provide them humanitarian assistance, political economic support, and of course, support for the armed forces of Ukraine. So this is what we are doing as Europeans. We allocated additional 500 million euros. So altogether, 1 billion euro is there to support the Ukrainian defense forces. And apart from this, there is also international pressure. So the diplomatic activities are ongoing in the UN, in international fora, to reinforce the isolation of Putin's regime on the international stage and to increase the international pressure on him to show that this is an aggression which is inhuman, illegal, and that is condemned by the majority of the international community. Just in terms of that military aid, the EU has got money to procure weapons now, hasn't it, on behalf uh, of Ukraine. Do we know where that's up? Have any of those weapons yet been delivered? Well, of course, I mean, this is right on track. The European Union allocated money, 1 billion euros, so the member states can make deliveries for Ukrainian defence forces, and then this, uh, this cost of the, of the supplies will be basically reimbursed. So it's not the EU supplying weapons, the EU is reimbursing member states for their shipments and deliveries to help the Ukrainians to defend their country and to fight for their freedom against the aggressor. The NATO Secretary General said we're now in for the long haul. A sense that this war could last not just weeks, months, maybe even years. Is, is that your view as well? The European Union wants to see immediate stop of the fighting and immediate withdrawal of Russian forces. That's the main objective. But of course we see no signs of uh, Putin trying to de-escalate or to back down from, his, from what he is doing. So, of course, we are counting on all the scenarios, the, the nasty scenarios as well, but we hope and we do everything in order to make this inhuman aggression to stop as soon as it gets. And just very finally, of course, you know, Britain's not in the EU anymore, but has there been a sense, actually, with this crisis that Britain has, in many ways, played a part that wouldn't be very, very different if it, if it was still inside the EU? Well, that's a highly speculative thing, but for a fact what we are seeing, UK is aligning with uh, the European sanctions, so UK is basically on the same page with the European Union. UK is a member of the NATO still, and we are part of the same transatlantic community. We share the objectives, we share the aims, and the aim is to stop the bloodshed and support Ukraine, and the UK is doing this also. So uh, this is the main thing right now. So we are on the same page with our like-minded partners, and this group of, of civilized nations is growing bigger, as we have seen also in the United nation vote and in the determination of more and more countries joining our sanctions and joining our efforts to stop this brutal, illegitimate and illegal aggression against Ukraine. Now, North Korea has confirmed it's tested its biggest intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, the dictator, North uh, Korean leader Kim Jong-un, was present during the launch and was pictured in rather bizarre Hollywood fashion, wearing sunglasses and walking slowly with his army generals in front of the new missile in a very weird kind of uh, promotional video there. Uh, the new type of ballistic missile is reportedly the biggest in North Korea to date and marks an end to a self-imposed ban on long-range testing, which has been in place since 2017. Joining me now to discuss what's going on there is the career expert, Professor Robert Kelly. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Robert Kelly. Um, Everybody has been so distracted by the awful events in Ukraine uh, that not a lot of attention was given to this over recent months. But the reality is that North Korea has restarted its testing program. What is the significance of that? And, and what about the timing? Yeah, so I think the North Koreans took a couple of years off. They, they paused in 2018. Um, because Donald Trump met Kim Jong-un and maybe there might have been some movement, there might have been some kind of deal. And I think that was a North Korean way of encouraging Trump to come to the table. But Trump is long gone. Those negotiations didn't really go anywhere. Biden, the current president, is more hawkish on North Korea than Trump was. And the new South Korean president or the incoming president, the guy who just got elected a couple of weeks ago, will be more hawkish as well than the current South Korean president, right? So I mean, the, the, the tables are turning against 
North Korea, and I think um, they're going back to the, to the testing that they have done in the past. I'm not sure if the timing is particularly that important. I mean, so it's possible that maybe they're sort of like using the distraction of Ukraine in order to pull this off. But I think generally the, the, the longer term framing is that, uh, you know, they want to build these weapons so they can strike the United States and keep the Americans, you know, sort of off balance if there were ever a conflict or something like that. I mean, that's sort of the point deterrence. And um, they're going to keep on testing and they've got to keep on making sure the weapons work and build larger ones. And so I'm not really sure that it's actually sort of tied to anything particular in the last few weeks. So that's interesting. I mean, for as long as anyone can remember, this is what the North Korean regime does. Um, and I would understand if people are a bit sort of shrug, shrug about it. You know, North Korea is always testing these missiles. How scared do you think people need to be about it? I mean, this is not a, a nothing situation, is it? Yeah, that's right. I don't think that. So I don't think the North Koreans are rational, right? I mean, that they're not ISIS and they're not Al Qaeda. I think that's sort of the most important place to start, right? I mean, if, if Osama bin Laden had a nuclear weapon, I mean, who knows what he would do? The Kims ultimately want to survive. Um, I think they'd like, maybe ideally, to sort of bully South Korea into some kind of federation or something. But really, I think the Kims want to survive more than anything else, and that's what these things are really designed to do. They're designed to prevent a repeat of 2017. You may remember with Donald Trump threatened fire and fury in the North Koreans can keep that from ever really happening again by developing these weapons. I mean, that's really the point, is to say, look, we can strike the continent of the United States, and so you should never strike us. Um, I don't actually think the North Koreans intend to use them for offense. I don't think they intend to sell them to terrorists. Um, it's a great and terrible threat that they have them, but I don't actually think that they're um, irrational or unstable or going to use them randomly. You mentioned President Trump there and, of course, that extraordinarily high-profile um, series of meetings with Kim Jong-un some years ago, uh, which, as you said, didn't really come to much. But nonetheless, uh, this testing program did go quiet for a bit. Do you think right. uh, if President Trump was still in power, um, Kim Jong-un would be, would be trying this stuff right now? I think so, because the Trump diplomatic initiative basically collapsed at the end of 2019. Um, Donald Trump met Kim Jong-un three times. The last time was in the summer of 2019. And then um, the um, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo went to Pyongyang. And then things basically sort of fell apart, and Trump really sort of gave up on it by 2020 when he was running for re-election. You may remember the idea was that a breakthrough with North Korea was supposed to be a sort of big foreign policy success he could market in the election, and that didn't really happen. And he basically gave up on it. So I think, yeah, I think the North Koreans would probably be be doing this. Um, and there was, I think, there was a window for about maybe six months to nine months when when President Trump might have really made a, a breakthrough. But ultimately, the, the the Americans and the North Koreans were too far apart. The, the offers the two made to each other were so far apart; they were so incompatible that um, there was no way to uh, to really sort of broker a deal. We should have started smaller instead of going for a, a sort of um, big and, and bang just... deal. Just, just very quickly, you're a professor of international relations theory. Um, I just wonder whether there's any way one would ever see the kind of invasion on the North Korean side to South Korea that we've seen uh, Russia do to Ukraine. Are there any parallels there? North Korea obviously has an enormous army compared to South Korea's resources. Whether it's any good is another question. Yeah, that's right. That, that's actually that's actually a fantastic question. And yes, I do think there is. There's actually a very direct parallel. Which, you know, the, the Russians are quite cleverly leveraging their nuclear weapons to keep NATO from intervening in Ukraine, right? I mean, basically, they're sort of like keeping us out in order to prosecute their conflict by using nuclear weapons to keep us back, right? And allow basically sort of forcing us only to sort of provide limited assistance we can't do in the no-fly zone, for example. And the possibility is that the North Koreans are thinking they can do yeah. the same, right? They can keep the Americans at bay. And then, Thank you. You know, have their way with. Thank you. Sorry to, to hurry this to a conclusion because we're just coming to the end of the show. But thank you very much indeed to Professor Robert Kelly uh, there on North Korea. And coming up next, it will be Liam Halligan with On the Money. You watch the briefing with me, Isabel Oakshot. The show's back next Friday. Hello again. I'm Aidan McGiven. Today. Just like every other day this week is dry for most with sunny skies up and down the country and it will feel warm in that sunshine with light winds under this area of high pressure which is now centred across the UK. So very little airflow around that high. That means that under the sun it will feel warm with temperatures well above average for the time of year. There is some cloud to speak of, mainly for Shetland where a few outbreaks of rain are possible through the